your eminence, holy fathers, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ, and honored guests. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to speak, to be back on campus at Holy Cross, and to see some of my old professors and visit with friends. Uh, for the sake of time, allow me just to begin. Uh, many of you know that I've been attached with the Georgian Orthodox Patriarchate for the past 15 years, and this paper represents part of that work. The following paper will present the cultivation of organizational relationships and interactions between an Eastern Orthodox Church body and Western aid organizations. From the time Georgian Christians were granted autocephaly by Antioch in the fifth century, the Georgian Orthodox Church has guided their flock through nearly continuous war and invasion, helped them recover from natural disasters, and mediated tolerance between or during ethnic and regional conflict. The Georgian Patriarchate is not new to the concept of emergency relief, though it has seldom enjoyed any benefit of outside support. While crisis response did not provide the nexus to introduce the Georgian Orthodox Church to 21st century Western organizations, careful exploration of project partnerships served to build trust and cooperation between otherwise alien organizations. This establishment of trust later facilitated coordination of relief efforts during moments of emergency. Sudden cooperation during crisis events likely would never have taken place without close attention to sensitivities on all sides during early stages of these developing relationships. Given the political instability following the Soviet collapse, the potential for social and ethnic conflict, and the enduring financial hardship for a majority of the population, His Holiness Patriarch Ilya II remains flexible towards Episcopal appointments in specific dioceses. In response to ethnic friction or political unrest, the Georgian Synod has convened and voted to exchange bishops between dioceses. This strategy is an effort to place the most relevant and qualified hierarch from the Synod as head of the diocese of a troubled area. From long before the collapse of the Soviet Union until the present day, His Holiness stands as the most respected individual and the Georgian Orthodox Church is the most respected institution in the country of Georgia. During moments of crisis and adversity, the Georgian people are very wary of national governments, placing all their hope for the future in the Georgian Orthodox Church and those appointed by the church. Prevailing conditions in post-Soviet Georgia into the early 2000s would be considered eligible for disaster relief in most parts of the Western world. Lack of electricity, of running water, of functional sewage systems and failing infrastructure would all qualify as acute hardship in 21st century America. These conditions remained persistent from the early 1990s and continued to contribute to flares of social unrest. Still, a more dangerous situation persists in the Transcaucasus and is the chief reason for the continued presence of multinational humanitarian aid, human rights, and watchdog groups in the region. In the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, five primary regions of intense ethnic conflict were identified in Europe and Eurasia. We were all painfully aware of the ethnic conflict in the 1990s, which consumed the Balkans and drew international involvement. Four similar regions existed simultaneously in the Caucasus and remain, remain potentially explosive today. Nagorno karabakh Nakhichivan, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia have all suffered from ethnic cleansing, producing millions of internally displaced persons due to civil war, rebellion, and terrorism instigated by local warrior, warlord factions. Independent of the abundance of international aid, the Georgian Orthodox Church worked diligent, diligently to serve all victims of the regional conflicts to the, the extent of its capacity and resource. However, the presence of so many well-endowed Western aid organizations stood in sharp contrast to the limited material resource available to the Georgian Church in the fulfillment of its native responsibility and mission. Yet the Georgian Orthodox Church remained wary of outside aid and distrustful of underlying intention. The Patriarch expected nothing from Western organizations and made little, little effort toward communication or cooperation. Consequently, aid organizations lacked any significant, credi any significant credibility with the Georgian Church or the society in general. Their humanitarian aid initiatives often prove counterproductive from cultural blunders, which rise from applying Western solutions to perceived Eastern problems and need. A bridge was needed to facilitate dialogue and understanding between very different perspectives and purposes for existence. During my first year in the Republic of Georgia under Metropolitan Nikolos, we studied and implemented a number of agricultural enterprises in the Eastern region of Cajeti. The Alazani Valley in this region is not unlike the rich and productive Sacramento Valley in California. While we were unable to secure agricultural grants from German and Dutch aid organizations focused upon the region, private funding from a number of American Orthodox donors helped to establish a foundation of activity which eventually caught the attention of World, of World Vision International. In addition, we had become introduced to Ambassador Richard Miles and a number of American and Georgian staff with the U.S. Embassy, 
with the director and select staff of USAID and the director of the US Peace Corps. While these US government agencies could not become directly involved with any of our projects or activities, individuals within these institutions opened avenues of opportunity and provided credibility to our initiatives. On return from a five-week lecture tour throughout America in early 2002, my second year in Georgia launched rapidly. An unscheduled presentation of our agricultural efforts at the World Vision offices in Washington, D.C. led directly to introductions to national directors in the Transcaucasus region. Evidently, World Vision had made periodic attempts to interact with the Georgian church since their arrival in 1994, but without success. While World Vision presents an evangelical Christian character as an organization, they are committed to, on a corporate level to supporting the primary Christian expression in a given country they serve. This had not been achieved in the Republic of Georgia during eight years of operation. A series of events in the spring and summer of 2002 helped us to quickly recognize several factors contributing to much of the communication difficulty. In one instance, the Georgian Orthodox Church is an independent institution not accustomed to leaning on outside service or support. There was no mechanism in place or perceived need to facilitate cooperation with Western aid organizations. Additionally, having withdrawn from the World Council of Churches in the 1990s to avoid internal schism, the Georgian church as a whole remains highly conservative and wary of any Western influence. For these reasons, many Western organizations often perceive the Georgian Orthodox Church as an impenetrable, mono impenetrable monolith and entirely unapproachable. Within the Western organizations, obstacles surfaced which contributed to complications in efforts to establish relationships. The projected air of confidence from U.S. government agencies often led directly to offense and impasse. Additionally, despite resources available, the U.S. Embassy seemed to avoid common sense. The liaison for religious affairs attached to the Embassy was a young 20-something American intern from Brigham Young University recently returned from Mormon mission. He was bilingual in English and Spanish. When we first met over coffee, he claimed no one from the Patriarch had ever returned his calls. As a consequence, his work fo focused primarily upon indigenous and indigenous Baptist sect, a Roman Catholic uh, charity, the Anglican Church from England, and several denominational mission efforts from America in a country that self-identifies 85% as Orthodox. From that initial, me initial meeting over coffee, I gained an introduction to the community liaison officer and discovered one of the security analysts in the U.S. Embassy was a former Marine, a convert to Orthodox Christianity, held a Ph.D. in Georgian language from the University of Chicago, and tutored under an iconographer during his tour in Sofia, Bulgaria. Upon meeting Dr. Humphreys, we, we discussed opportunities to build connections between the U.S. Embassy and the Georgian Patriarchate during the few months remaining in his tour in Georgia. In addition to his own works of iconography, Daniel Humphreys had gathered a personal collection of nearly two dozen icons from Bulgaria, Romania, and Serbia. He suggested offering an exhibit of his icons in the foyer of the U.S. Embassy and arranged for me to deliver a general presentation on the role of iconography in the Orthodox Church. The community liaison, liaison officer, a Georgian national, organized a broadcast of announcements to NGOs throughout the region. On the morning of the presentation, there was standing room only, with representatives from every significant aid organization in Tbilisi. All were interested to learn more about the Georgian Orthodox Church. Within a few weeks, we arranged a reception for a contingent from the U.S. Embassy to meet at the Patriarchate in order for Dan, Dr. Humphreys to present one of his own hand-painted icons of St. Hermit of Alaska to His Holiness Patriarch Ilya. Dr. Humphreys graciously commanded the attention of every Georgian in the hall through his masterful use of their language. From that moment on, channels between the Georgian Patriarchate and the U.S. government offices facilitated contact between military offices, scholarship programs, and the U.S. consulate. The impasse between World Vision and the Georgian Church was more difficult to identify and address. Originally, World Vision did not arrive in Georgia strictly as a humanitarian aid organization. There were no food programs, no health programs, and no area development projects. No resident expatriate staff was initially assigned to Tbilisi. Staffing was filled solely by Georgian nationals, creating internal frictions in the area of corporate policy compliance. World Vision's international venture into Georgia in the mid-90s was to establish micro-enterprise development based upon the Grameen Bank model developed in Bangladesh by Nobel laureate Professor Muhammad Yunus. This was a favored method among several multinational nonprofit organizations to initiate operations in the post-Soviet Caucasus. Successful MED programs provi provided substantial local income as a low-interest lending institution before expanding into more traditional nonprofit activities requiring donations, grants, and less certain sources of funding. From the perspective of the senior Georgian staff, World Vision International had simply supplied them with the capital to create their own personal bank without committing any personal funds. 
While the program appeared to function according to prescribed financial parameters, later observations indicated the original Georgian team had pursued MED principles at odds with a formula proposed by Muhammad Yunus. Yunus's financial approach was a grassroots initiative primarily committed to aid fledgling startup business operations run by small coalitions of women at risk. The World Vision MED program supported only the expansion of existing profitable businesses, almost entirely led by established affluent men. In addition, the World Vision team in Tbilisi was led by four Georgian nationals who were personally aligned with the schismatic monastic group in Georgia, which had been first censured and then excommunicated by the Patriarchate due to their insubordination and antagonism, which led to the forced departure of the Georgian church from the World Council of Churches. In spite of claims by, by key staff of protecting the Georgian church from becoming polluted by dirty Protestant money, they were deliberately undermining any attempts to build cooperation with World Vision and the Georgian Patriarchate. By 2000, internal friction reached such a point with World Vision that a resident national director had been assigned from London. He then filled several key positions with executives from America and Europe. By mid-2002, when Metro Metropolitan Nicholas and I began exploring dialogue with World Vision, World Vision Georgia, the stage had been set for a slow reverse, reversal of Georgian control over the local humanitarian aid organization. Within six months, three of the former leaders had resigned. Within two years, World Vision Georgia had become the largest NGO in the Transcaucasus region. The period of transition from 2002 through 2004 provided ample opportunity, opportunity to examine areas of mutual interest, developing communications and cooperation toward an atmosphere of trust. Two partnership projects in particular provided the vehicle toward a comfortable degree of organizational trust. The university level summer expeditions in our diocese and the youth Bible curriculum, which had already been implemented in a number of Orthodox countries, but with varying de degrees of success in Ru Russia, Romania, Serbia, and Albania. Without going into detail about the specific development of each project, a summary will illust illustrate some of the hurdles overcome as World Vision adapted policies to fit the way in which the new, the Georgian church natively operated in its own country. As Georgia transitioned from the rule of Edward Shevardnadze to the Western supported government of Mikhail Saakashvili, state funding became less available for church activities. This provided an opportunity for World Vision to begin offering small support in the form of fuel subsidies needed for transportation and supply of the month-long summer expeditions in the remote southern highlands. After attempting several grant prop propositions, the World Vision office in Vienna recommended a direct cash donation of $5,000 for a one-time purchase of entire blocks of gasoline and diesel fuel vouchers from Luke Oil, which is available throughout the country. All receipts were accounted for in advance, and fuel vouchers were distributed by the diocese as needed, whether for direct purchase of fuel or as a barter system for needed local goods. By 2007, the level of support of the summer expeditions had reached $160,000 a year. Implementing the youth Bible curriculum was more complicated because the project were, would directly involve the Department of Religious Education of the Georgian Patriarchate, Gospel Light Publishing in Ventura, California, and World Vision. Both of these organizations were accustomed to recognition for any mission work in the field. By 2002, the international program had failed twice in Russia, once in Romania. In Albania, His Eminence Archbishop Anastasios halted publication to allow time for significant editing before going to press. Negotiating these initial struggles contributed to a seamless implementation under His Holiness Patriarch Pavle of Serbia. The Georgian Patriarchate stood next in line to benefit from the painful experiences and earlier compromises shaping the development of this Orthodox Bible curriculum sponsored on a multinational level. World Vision and Gospel Light Publishing provided financial support to match funds and volunteer efforts expended by the Georgian Orthodox Church in the development of Bible study materials de developed for young people. Against strong protests from World Vision and Gospel Light Publishing, the Georgian Patriarchate took two full years to thoroughly translate, re-illustrate, and publish the first edition of educational materials. The Georgian Church also insisted on no printed recognition of World Vision or Gospel Light Publishing in the final editions. Recognition and gratitude would be expressed between organizations, but not in print, which could become a reason for rejection by Georgian clergy and the faithful. Having the blessing of His Holiness Patriarch Ilya was enough to ensure the materials would be used at all levels. Upon publication, the Patriarchate resisted, resisted, resisted the push by World Vision to put the printed materials in the hands of bishops and priests as quickly as possible. Instead, pilot programs were tested with a select group of bishops and dioceses in different regions of the country. During the annual synodal meeting six months later, reports from bishops involved in the pilot program were so positive 
that demand swiftly spread the materials throughout the remaining dioceses. While these two examples of partnership efforts between World Vision International and the Georgian Patriarchate did not serve any specific emergency relief scenarios, the projects did establish a faith humanitarian nexus. These initial cooperative achievements served to build long-term relationships to experience recovery from communication difficulties and cultural misunderstandings, and to establish levels of trust among organizations having very different purposes and worldviews. A growing number of government and non-government organizations gradually developed an effective approach to interact with the Georgian Orthodox Church. Equally, the Georgian Patriarchate came to prudently trust the intentions of a network of Western organizations interested in offering assistance and support to select areas of the Georgian Church's mission. This groundwork proved invaluable in late 2008 when Russian Federation forces used an internal policing action by the governor, Georgian government as an, as an excuse to invade 20% of Georgian sovereign territory. Years of practice and learning to work together played a critical role when the Russian government would permit only the Georgian Orthodox Church to enter the occupied territory of conflict zones in order to care for the dead and wounded. From this foundation of trust, disaster response initiatives of several Western humanitarian aid organizations were able to channel support and resources through a known and trusted Eastern partner. This could not and would not have happened years earlier. Thank you. Thank you.